Every time the Prophet, peace be upon him, was so kind with children, children would come and jump on his back when he's in the prayer. So he would prolong sujood, just only for the sake of these children to enjoy riding, just to play with them. He was the best commander in the field and the best scholar, but yet at the same time he was the best in dealing with children. Assalamu alaikum brother. This is Kul Naidu from Bangalore. I'm a reward sister. I have a question for you. I see parents beating or scolding their children for having been dropped something which is very expensive or breaking something which is very expensive. But when it comes to salah or breaking the ethics and Islam or manners, it's the other way around. They wouldn't react the same way. Can you let us know how to deal with these kinds of situations? I'm not talking about the small kids, say when after 12 years old, for girls and boys more, both of them. Thank you so much, sister. Let me tell you that the definition of children, when we talk about children, what do we mean? What age category are we talking about? We are talking about children who are, who have not reached the age of puberty. That's normally 15 years of age, just around that time. That is the definition. And as you know, from a fiqh point of view, uh, the age of puberty has three signs in a male boy, in the males, and three and four signs in the females. The, for boys, it's either they reach the age of 15, or they grow hair around the private parts, or they start ejaculating the sperm. Now, if they do any of these, they have reached the age of puberty, and at that time they are adults, and they are considered mukallaf. They have the obligation to be, you know, to do all the various obligations, responsibility, uh, such as prayer and fasting and hajj if they are able, and so on. Now, these signs are also applicable for girls, plus when the girl starts menstruating, having the period. That is a fourth sign. Now, yes, absolutely, just like the sister was saying, I know that some parents, many parents in fact, do this. They spank their children, they scorn them, they just, they broke something, they actually committed a, uh, something that is wrong or even something that is uh, valuable in the house or outside the house and yet when it comes to morals and behaviors they're not really that um, you know firm in their uh, education and in their direction to the children we need to emphasize the most important issues here and I think we need to take it just like look at Annas you know Annas was a boy and we I think that um, and I feel that uh, he uh, was not perfect Obviously, he made some mistakes. He would be late. He would break things. He would not do things the right way the Prophet wanted him to do. Yet, he never said to him, why did you do this the way you did it? Why you did not do the thing which I asked you to do? You see, he was so kind. Even at one time when he was late for coming to the Prophet he had a, a little miswak. You know, he used to clean his mouth with and he said, you know, if it were not for the fear of punishment from Allah, I would strike you with this. How would a little miswak would inflict any harm on a little boy? But it was just like only to show him that the Prophet ﷺ was serious. So we need to be serious, yes, with children. But if something like this happened, we say, subhanallah, it happened. May Allah give us, uh, compensate us for this. And that would be the best thing if we try to do it. Look how the end result will be for our children. They will be so much in love with us. I did not talk about today about the reaction of children, how they in return, because of how he dealt with them, they loved the Prophet wasallam so much. They, you know, when, when he would, uh, like he used to bring his daughter Fatima and have her sit in his place, okay? when she was a little girl. Now, as she, you know, became a younger woman, 
she used, when the Prophet ﷺ used to come in, she used to get out from her place and ask the Prophet to sit in the best place in the house. You see, it's just like this. Whatever you do to children, they will react in the same way. If we say, it's okay, whatever happened, alhamdulillah, the most important thing is that you are safe and this thing can be compensated, I think they will feel the responsibility. They will not do it the next time. But if we say, you are the worst child I've ever seen. You know, who's going to give us something, you know, like this? You broke this and you did this. You know, next time they will try to retaliate, which is going to make things even worse. And we're losing uh, their guidance. We're losing their obedience, their love. And the most important thing is they may not be straight good boys in the sense that they would be righteous, obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I think all of these are important ways to deal with such an issue. Assalamu alaikum brother. I'm asking a question on behalf of sister Shaheen Khan. She is a physiotherapist by profession. Her question is that she loves children a lot, but she cannot show her love physically by hugging, cuddling or kissing them. And because of this, all the children feel that she is very rude. So she would like to know how can she soften her heart and express her love to the children? Well, this brings me to thank you, sister, for the question. And uh, speaking on behalf of someone uh, else, it's interesting because in today's world, I know with the values of society is changing, particularly in the West, Alhamdulillah, I hope this is not the case in India or in sub-Indian continent. It's not the case, surely, in the Arab world or probably the rest of the Muslim world, that whenever you see a child, the most important thing is to come and you, you hug that child without having a fear or a problem that this would be misinterpreted. You know, or they said, well, look at this. They're really having some bad intention when they bring children to them and they hug them and they cuddle them and they, they show them some affection. Well, that is the normal case for a woman who is treating children or a man who's treating children as well. There is no difference in this. And I think to show that, you have to get it out. You know, it's not enough that you have this love for children and compassion. It has to be expressed the Prophet ﷺ could have just told us, well, it's enough that you love children in your heart and no need to, to express it. But he was expressing it in the most clear way. There is no doubt about how he dealt with children in the most affectionate uh, way. He carried them on his back. He loved them. He hugged them. He held them. He gave them prizes. He played with them. And I think we should do the same, at least if that is acceptable by parents and there is no reason for us not to be, you know, closer to them. For example, if uh, I don't know about physiotherapy, but if for some reason, if someone is sick and he has some contagious disease, of course, coming closer to children might harm them. So in that case, you might express your way of praising them, of giving them something when you are not physically in direct contact of these children. But it's so important to express it to the most possible way and, of course, in the most decent and kind way in order to gain their love and to show them that they are worth this love and mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us in our hearts. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum as I'm Muhammad Abdul Rashid from Calcutta. I am a Tolly of Jinnati Masjid-Topsia. I see in my locality, generally, regular and senior Musallis throw away 10-year-old boys, 10-year-old young boys, who are shown so lovingly by the daughters of our locality to say their prayers in Jama. And they are kicked out that you go back, back, or they come late, but they, those uh, young boys of 10 years and 11 years, they are kick back, go back, go back, uh, although they are in lines and they don't disturb. Ten year boys, ten year and eleven boys are, is it all right? No, it's not. You already said it, subhanallah. What right do they have to kick these children out from 
the congregational prayer. In fact, let me tell you something even more than that, Sheikh. You know, one time, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam were actually on a journey. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ya Ummul Qawma Aqra'uhum Li Kitabillah That the one who leads the prayer should be the one who has the most of the glorious Qur'an, who recites more, who memorizes more. And if that one who memorizes more is a little young boy, he should lead the prayer and be the Amir of that group because he has the glorious Qur'an in his heart rather than the elder ones. You see, age here is not the criterion. The criterion is the love of Allah, the adherence to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the way they conduct themselves. Suppose there is an old person, yet this person is really crazy or out of his mind or is not acting in the rational way. Is he supposed to be the one in Salah? and disturbing others. This is the point. So I think here we have to respect children from that perspective and try to win their hearts because today they are children, tomorrow they are the adults and the leaders of the society. Sir, I have three daughters, Alia, Arshia and Ariba. Alia is nine year old, Arshia is six year old, and Ariba is one year old. My eldest daughter, she is very aggressive, and the middle one, she is assertive, and the youngest one is very mild. So I'm very worried about my elder daughter. She is very aggressive, and she sometimes argue with her mother, but she is very normal with me, and my rest of the daughters are normal. So what can I do in this case? Thank you. First, may Allah bless all the three daughters for you. Thank you. May Allah have them a reason for you to train them so well, so that you can, with that, enter paradise by the grace of Allah, inshallah. How to deal with my eldest uh, daughters? Talking about how you deal with children who are aggressive or are a very tough personality to deal with. This is not an exception. Even at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there used to be children who used to be aggressive, but he used to even deal with them. Look, even the people of Quraysh, for, the companions. Let me tell you the story about one boy who was about, I don't know, maybe 10 years old. And during the Battle of Badr, they found this child who knew the non-believers who came from Mecca to fight the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions and they asked him how many people are there in your own army he said I don't know they brought him and they kept hitting him and and punishing him for this and then when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saw this he said what are you doing come boy come here tell me and he's with all softness said how many camels do they slaughter every day now the child does not know the large numbers. He, he, he could not say 900 or 1,000 or something like this. He said, how many camels do they slaughter every day? Now the number of camels, he can see them. They are just, you know, so few and he would count them. He said, well, between 9 and 10. He said, thank you. Well, the army is between 900 and 1,000 because a camel would be enough for 100 people to eat. All right? So, you know, he dealt with with the boy, and, uh, and this boy was not a Muslim. He dealt with him according to his own level of understanding and the personality. So we need to deal with children as they are, and I think we can change them by the grace of Allah. First, by making dua, which is so important. Secondly, by bringing them closer. Yes, they might. We have to discover their personality. Maybe there's something that will intrigue them, will you know, if this probably aggressive daughter, for example, you know, will tell her that, okay, you're a brave one. Why don't you take care of a family? We will let you today cook our food for us. I think she might be pleased with that. And she might change from this aggressive person because she said, well, I have all the qualities in the world and yet nobody is giving me any care. You see? So we would have to deal with them in a way that will find them 
you know, that is suitable to their own personality and take the talents and employ them for their own improvement, plus, of course, making the dua and being kind and soft to them. May Allah bless them for you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah. Awalana Shaykh Ahmad, ashkuruka li hadhi al-kalima al-qayma. Uh, I am brother Abdul Hamid Malik from Mauritius. I am an Arabic teacher. So I came to Bombay for visit. My question, brother Ahmad, you know, nowadays we've got many parents, they just concentrate about the education, modern education, secular education for the children. They may spend a lot of money for the private tuition and they neglect the part of the Islamic uh, education. So what advice could you give to these parents, Brother Ahmad? Thank you so much, Barakallahu Feek. May Allah give you all the support in teaching Arabic because Arabic is the language of the Quran and the language of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam. And we have to learn it as much as possible because that is the means to understand the glorious Quran and the prophetic Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam. Now, first let me emphasize not only we need the systematic education or education in schools. The first and most important school is the home. We have to start with the home. We have to start with the parents first. The mother and the father and the rest of the family members so that they need to have their positive influence on the young children from the very early stages. Secondly, as you said, yes, of course, we have to take them to an Islamic school if that is possible and available. And we have to choose for them the best schools because they will be tomorrow the leaders. We don't want them just only to learn Islamic education without learning something beside that that can give them sustenance and risk in this life. It's so important to combine the two together but so they can lead an, a good Islamic life with a good Islamic education but at the same time they have a job and profession in their own hands that we don't want them to go and live begging people for their own sustenance this is not what is meant by the Islamic education Islamic education has to combine the two together and I think you're absolutely right we cannot spend on them in private schools teaching them all of the manners of the modern educational system yet neglecting the most important thing and believe me the environment is so important if we take them to a mixed school for example they will not respect hijab for example they will not have the etiquettes and manners of what a Muslim society is supposed to lead so it's important to have the two together and we should with all our efforts Support the Islamic schools, improve them, make them the best by the grace of Allah, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. I am Ruina Khan. I'm a student. My question is how can we coincide outer environment and family environment? Because children are more impressed by peer group. Thank you so much, sister. Yes, absolutely correct. We have to choose for them their own peers. We cannot just let them in the streets go with whomever they want because this is going to, you know, spoil our efforts as of what we need to do for them. Yes, the family might be doing so well, yet when they go with their own, with their own peers in the streets, in the school, when they play and so on, they will be influenced by that. But we need also to instill in them the strong personality of influence so they can be influential rather than be influenced by other. We need to have them influence others, be leaders, and always come and check with them. You know, as, you, as they go out, tell me, whom did you play with today? What did you do? You know, what ideas do you have? All of these things. But also, we have to have them go with their own parents. You know, we should not be busy with life so that we will not have the opportunity to be joined by our children when because they need the time they need this companionship look at these young boys and girls who used to come with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he used to take these boys even to expeditions and to travel with him and he used to teach them 
And you know, the most important thing of teaching, when he gives them advice, he doesn't give them ad the individual advice in front of everyone else. He used to give them this individually, as they would ride behind him and he would say, well, Ya Mu'adh, you know, as he was, was talking to Mu'adh when he was a young boy, or is he talking to Ibn Abdullah ibn Abbas when he was riding with him, or to Al-Fadl ibn Abbas when he was riding with him, or Abdullah ibn Umar when he was with him alone, you see? And these are the companions who reported what he was saying to us, because he always emphasized these manners and teachings as they were with him. But he would say it in a very soft way in order to win their hearts before he wins their minds. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Fazlur Ali. I'm from Assam. Would you be kind enough to tell us that what is the possible age, minimum possible age of the children to start the Salat? And the next point is the person grew up and during his growing up he became sick. He or she became sick for a month. Partly for the 20 days he or she was insane and partly on the 10 days without sense. No senses? No sense. Partly sense, partly no sense. Okay. Now the thing is this, could it be compensated by money, by fedia, other things? First question is about the age of a boy when we need to start teaching them how, when to pray. Right? When to make salah. And the second question is about someone who uh, lost his consciousness for 20 days yeah. and was not able to pray and then he was able to be conscious in the next nine days but he did not pray during these 29 days right but he could not go for the prayer he did not pray yeah well i'll answer both questions inshallah let me answer the first question first question regarding the minimum age well children by the way were not asked we were not asked to tell them to pray until the age of seven. Yes, we could say, you know, they would act like us, they would see us pray. We might take them to the masjid if they behave well, if they don't disturb. We can take them to the masjid so they can watch and see the congregation. Regarding the second question, a person who went into unconsciousness and was not because of sickness and weakness, he was not able to pray for 20 days and now and even he was awake for the next nine days, but he did not pray. Well, he made a mistake for not praying in the second part. When he was awake and conscious, he was supposed to pray in the best way possible. As Allah says, Fattakullaha mastata'tum. Fear Allah to the best of your ability. You know, even if he's sitting in his own bed, even if he cannot move, he may pray even with his own eyes. Just closing his eyes and opening them would be enough if he cannot move his body, if he cannot move his hands, if he cannot move his legs, and all of that. So, to the best thing, he should pray standing, if not sitting, if not on the side, if not lying back, if not on the stomach. Wherever possible, a person is supposed to, to pray and should not delay prayer out of his own time for any reason. I don't think that it can be compensated by money. No. If someone does not pray, it would not be even enough to pay in sadaqah the whole worth of the world in wealth. Because salah is so important. It has to be done by the person. As long as this person is conscious and is aware of himself and his responsibility towards the prayer. So whatever possible means available to do the prayer a person shall do it thank you very much barakallahu feek